from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we're going to move now to a, a more modern topic, uh, although one that echoes the Magna Carta, sort of the Magna Carta uh, as it, uh, uh, the values of the Magna Carta come to us today, focusing on civil liberties and surveillance. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to have two distinguished members of Congress uh, here with us to discuss these issues, uh, Congressman Nadler and Congressman Sensenbrenner. Uh, the issues we want to focus on are how does uh, our political system strike the balance between uh, the needs of the government to investigate uh, and, of course, the countervailing concerns of civil liberties and privacy. And because we have two members of Congress, I wanted to focus specifically on the role of Congress. Uh, for many of us, the questions raised about, say, scope of surveillance powers really go back to 9-11 and the Patriot Act that followed soon after. And I wanted to start with the question of, of lessons. What are the lessons that we've learned since 9-11, what are the lessons since the Patriot Act? And in particular, what are the successes and failures focusing on Congress's role? And uh, perhaps, uh, Congressman Nadler, I'll, I'll start with you. What do you think are the lessons we've learned since the Patriot Act and since 9-11 in, in terms of Congress's role in this area? I think we've learned several lessons. Uh, number one, do not legislate in haste. The uh, Patriot Act, uh, uh, Congressman Sensenbrenner was chairman of the committee at the time we passed it. Uh, the Patriot Act actually passed the committee, the Judiciary Committee, unanimously, believe it or not, with all the Democrats and Republicans voting for it. After three or four days of, of, he, of, of markup and, and amendments, and actual amendments being passed, not on party line votes, but on, on, on the merits, um, that bill was reported out unanimously, on, I think, on a Thursday. We came back the next week. There was almost an entirely different Patriot Act. Uh, that had been completely rewritten technically in the Rules Committee, really, uh, either by leadership or in the White House. And we, we, the, we, we voted on that bill before we really had a chance to properly examine it. Uh, and, and one of the things I said on the floor in voting against it was that uh, uh, I didn't like it for reasons A, B, and C, but in addition to which I said there'll be reasons D, E, and F that we don't know about yet, but which we'll find out about later, which, which was true, but we were under tremendous time pressure. So number one, when you're dealing with, with sensitive topics and important topics, don't legislate in haste. Take the time to read it. That bill should have gone out to the law professors, to the, to the ACLU, to others, and gotten back comments. All right, number one. Number two, have a, a very vigorous oversight and don't believe what the executive branch tells you. Um, some of the worst things that have happened, uh, whether rendition and torture, and we saw the report that came out today, or the Guantanamo um, were basically done in secret. And uh, the oversight by Congress was grossly insufficient. I would say that oversight on anything to do with civil liberties, um, the intelligence information should be given to the Judiciary Committee as well as the Intelligence Committee. Uh, the third lesson is be very careful of secrets. Um, I think the worst thing, worse than the surveillance that we have is the state secrets doctrine, which was basically invented by the Supreme Court, but the way it's evolved today, um, it, well, let's put it this way, how do you enforce any right, whether the right is granted by Magna Carta or by the, or, or by the Constitution or by the statute, how do you enforce a right? You enforce a right by going to court, by saying, and either getting an injunction, stop, or damages, you, you've damaged me, and therefore without that, anything you have becomes like the Soviet Constitution of 1936, very nice to read, but irrelevant. Um, the state secrets doctrine, which basically now says that um, the government can dismiss any lawsuit, dismiss any suit for damages, or, or even for an injunction, simply by saying this uh, implicate, the, the, the subject matter of this lawsuit is a state secret, it cannot be heard, case dismissed. Many courts will, most courts will dismiss it without any necessity for a showing that that's in fact the case, means you can't get a hearing and essentially rights are unenforceable. So I think, and that's 
probably the biggest problem we have right now as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Congressman Sensenbrenner, do you have the similar lessons or different ones? Uh, I have some different ones. Uh, first of all, you know, issues like rendition and torture, that's not a part of the Patriot Act. It's true that the Patriot Act was passed in haste, but one of the things that I successfully got in there was an oversight uh, uh, responsibility and a sunset. And uh, in the year before the first sunset, which was at the end of 2005, uh, I had uh, hearings in the Judiciary Committee on each one of the 17 expanded powers that were given to law enforcement and the intelligence community one by one, and at that time, uh, it was discovered that 14 of those 17 powers were non-controversial and they were made permanent. Uh, the ones that weren't made permanent were the rolling wiretaps, the business records provision, um, and the lone wolf terrorist provision, which was not a part of the original Patriot Act, but was added to that part of the law by the Intelligence Act of 2004 and it was determined at that time that we hadn't had enough experience to be able to determine whether it ought to be made permanent or not. So uh, everybody supported making permanent those 14 provisions, so it wasn't all that controversial. The lessons that we have learned is that there was a complete failure of oversight by both the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government. And that's one of the reasons why when we found out uh, the results of this abject failure, uh, I drafted and introduced the Freedom Act, uh, a version of which which passed the House uh, in May of this year, but somehow got off the track in the, uh, in the Senate. Um, and what it attempted to do uh, was to deal with better oversight, better oversight particularly in the White House uh, because the people who run the intelligence uh, and defense operations are all presidential employees and appointees. Uh, uh, better oversight in the judicial branch because the FISA court, or what we call the FISC, only heard one side of the argument, the governments, uh, and better oversight uh, by the legislative branch because the intelligence committees in both houses, which were originally established by the Church Commission in the 70s, uh, ended up being cheerleaders for the intelligence community rather than doing strict oversight and making corrections before things got out of hand. Well, they did get out of hand, and as a result, I think we're going to have to learn our lesson on that. Now, I'm very unhappy that the Senate didn't break the filibuster uh, on the Freedom Act and at least pass their own version. And here I'm critical of my own party. The result of the filibuster is going to be a game of chicken next year on business records. The business records section, section 215, expires on June 1st of next year. And if it is not extended in some form or another, there will be no uh, legal authority for the intelligence community to get business records uh, short of getting a grand jury subpoena. And um, uh, I think that that would increase the vulnerability of, of, of our country. Uh, I would be willing to predict that our beloved senators, uh, both the returning ones and the newly elected ones, are going to spend an inordinate amount of time trying to reach the balance between security and privacy and civil liberties on the other side uh, to come up with something that will be acceptable to both houses and the White House. That is not an easy thing to do. We found that uh, on the House side. We are far, far ahead of where the Senate is, and uh, the Freedom Act is going to be back next year. We're going to figure out how to tee this up to try to get it passed again. But I can tell you that uh, sometimes the, the people who play the game of chicken are the proverbial chicken who is supposed to cross the road and instead stopped in the middle of the road clucking away and got hit by a car. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh one, one branch of government that was mentioned, although you didn't, neither of you focused on, was the role of the judiciary. Uh, of course, traditionally, uh, by interpreting the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution and other constitutional provisions, the judiciary has had a significant role in the area of surveillance law. Uh, and so under the current regime, both the legislative branch and the judicial branch have their own spheres. I'm, I'm interested in 
your sense of what the proper relationship is between those two branches, particularly in this area of surveillance law. So as you may know, uh, Justice Alito, in a concurring opinion uh, recently uh, in a case called Riley versus California, suggested that if uh, the legislature, in particular Congress, has legislated in an area of privacy, then the courts should stay out of that particular area and let, let Congress assume the primary role. Is, is that the right relationship? What, what role do you think Congress should take and the courts should take in interpreting the Constitution and in enacting statutory law? Well, with most other laws, uh, Congress passes a law and then the Supreme Court decides whether or not it's constitutional as a result of somebody withstanding bringing a case that has some constitutional implications. Um, where I think the problem is in this area is that the FISC does not play in the traditional uh, judicial role, uh, which is there is an adversarial procedure where the government and those who are opposed to the government present their arguments to the judges and then the judges <laughs> uh, apply the fact and the law and reach a decision. It's just the government, meaning NSA through the Justice Department. And then this makes the judges of the FISC really policy makers rather than arbiters uh, of a dispute. And one of the things that Mr. Nadler and I agree on is that there should be some kind of uh, uh, agency that, or individual that would have standing uh, to bring a counter argument before the FISC. Uh, and then the FISC would be able to go back to the role of being judges rather than policy makers. Judges are not appointed to be policy makers, at least those of us who spent our lives in legislatures uh, 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 for most of our adult lives, they were uh, appointed to be arbiters. Now, you know, we've also got some really conflicting decisions on the Fourth Amendment. You know, for example, you need a warrant to be able to uh, uh, tap a telephone and find out what uh, uh, the spoken conversations by the parties to the phone call uh, are, but you don't need a warrant to get uh, various types of text messaging. So uh, 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 emails, text, Facebook posts, Twitter feeds, and things like that uh, can be obtained without a warrant. And I don't think that there should be a difference uh, in between the two you know, particularly as we're getting more into the digital age and uh, people are using modern technology to communicate rather than doing it the old fashioned way. You know, I can say that uh, during the campaign in one student area in my district uh, where I didn't do very well in 2012, I had the college Republicans uh, put up a whole lot of posters that said the government knows what you did last night. Uh, and uh, then saying that I'm trying to stop that and you ought to vote for me. My vote went up 20% in those, those precincts. Now, I did show this to somebody uh, from overseas and they said, couldn't you have gotten even more attention instead of by saying the government knows what you did last night, putting up your mother knows what you did last night? That was going a little too far. Well, I, I, I agree. I certainly agree uh, with respect to the Fisk Court. I would, I would go further. Uh, I'm not sure I'd go further than, than uh, Congressman Sensenbrenner would, but further than he mentioned. Um, you need an adversary proceeding, but you also need common law. That is to say, when the Fisk rules, nobody knows what it ruled. So you don't develop, maybe you develop a secret common law, a secret law, but, you don't, but Congress doesn't know and the public doesn't know. The opinions accept, where, where the, I believe that where the opinions uh, define what the law is, when they, say, when they say the Patriot Act means this and not that, that ought to be public. So that the public knows, and Congress knows, what the law has been interpreted to be, and maybe we want to change it, maybe not, but at least you know what the law is. Now certainly you're not going to say that they should uh, publish who they're putting a subpoena out to, obviously, but, but certainly when they're, legal precedents should be known in addition to having a, 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 the advocacy there. Secondly, the problem in the court also is the State Secrets Act. The administration, this administration, has used the State Secrets Act to basically prevent the courts from, from adjudicating most constitutional claims uh, of, of improper surveillance, of, uh, 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 of improper detention, etc. 
Um, you even get the situation, even get the situation where the government um, um, allegedly improperly uses surveillance on you, and you bring a lawsuit. And they say, well, whether we view surveillance is a secret, so you can't establish standing by saying you've been surveilled. And the courts have upheld that. So the State Secrets Act, ought to, the State Secrets Doctrine, I'm saying, ought to be amended in, in, many, in, in many ways so that the courts can adjudicate these questions, uh, that our rights can be enforced in court, and that uh, you, you can't just uh, escape the, 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 the jurisdiction of the court. Uh, standing is another problem. Congress has to step in and, and act in a lot of these place, uh, areas. Um, obviously, um, the courts have their role, Congress has its role. It's impossible to define exactly what that role is. It's always uh, like the, the saying, what's the role of the executive and the role of Congress? It changes from time to time, it evolves. Uh, uh, they both have their roles. Uh, right now, I would say that uh, uh, the courts have hung back from properly enforcing uh, individual rights because they've been too deferential on questions of state secrets. Um, and I think Congress has too. Um, both of you focused on the role of the FISC, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Uh, and one unusual aspect, what we learned how the FISC was operating, was that it was in fact issuing these long opinions interpreting the surveillance laws in a context when normally courts would not issue opinions. So for example, if a prosecutor or a law enforcement agent goes to a judge seeking a warrant, normally the judge is just going to issue the warrant or deny the, the application. They're not going to write an opinion on the, how the Constitution may apply. Uh, is the difficulty in your view that the FISC issued opinions without the benefit of adversarial briefing, or is the problem that the FISC is issuing opinions at all? And, and maybe the broader question is, do, do you think the idea of having a foreign intelligence surveillance court is the right path? Are there better ways of designing surveillance laws, or are we best off with the basic structure we have now, and perhaps only slightly amending well, it going forward? Well, I, you know, I would I would submit uh, that the institution of the FISC is not a bad uh, uh, institution in dealing with things where you have to have more secrecy than in a lot of other uh, judicial proceedings. Uh, the problem, I think, is that uh, the FISC doesn't tell anybody, including lots of members of Congress, uh, or maybe no members of Congress off the Intelligence Committee at all what they're doing. And the Freedom Act requires a notification of FISC decisions uh, to the Intelligence and Judiciary Committees within a day after uh, they are made and a sanitized version uh, being released to the public within 45 days. And that way, if the FISC is making a determination that uh, the Congress doesn't think uh, comports with the law or Congress decides the law to be changed, uh, then we know what the problem is and we can take the appropriate action. But as of now, we're completely in the dark on that. And uh, if you've looked at the debates over the Freedom Act, uh, you will find that uh, uh, the intelligence committees think that we're the enemy rather than the people that mm -hmm. uh, uh, the intelligence community is trying to root out to prevent them from blowing us up. Well, the intelligence committees have been the subject of regulatory capture. Um, like many regulatory agencies, they've been captured by the agencies that, they, uh, uh, that they're supposed to regulate. And they really represent their interests, with some exceptions, but they represent their interests in Congress rather than representing uh, the interests of, 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 of Congress and through Congress of the people in, in, in restraining or, or regulating the intelligence agencies, which is why I mentioned before that one of the things we ought to make sure happens is that a lot of this intelligence, a lot of these surveillance decisions uh, are made known to the Judiciary Committees, if not to the Congress as a whole, but to the Judiciary Committees as well as to the Intelligence Committees, because the Judiciary Committee has a different concern generally, a, a focus on rights and, and law. Um, I, I, I think that, um, um, I forgot the question you asked at this point. Uh, should we amend the role of the FISC oh, more broadly? Uh, well, as we said, I, I certainly agree with, uh, with Jim. We should amend the role of the FISC in the ways that we stated. Adversary and public, as I said before, co publish the comment, publish the decisions to the extent, and the, the Freedom Act does that. But it's not just the FISC. The FISC was set up in the aftermath of the Church Committee in, 19, in, in the late 70s, which was investigating intelligence and abuses, the FBI's COINTELPRO program in, 
and, and so forth. Uh, and it was one of, 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 of a number of reforms to rein in the intelligence communities, the FBI and so forth. And to some extent, it's been okay. But they certainly, the fact that they issued decisions, or opinions, I should say, not decisions, the fact that they issue opinions on these warrants where they're interpreting the law is a good thing. But those opinions ought to be, insofar as possible, public and certainly made known uh, to Congress so that you can have a development of a public common law, uh, modifiable by legislation if necessary, and, 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 and you know what's going on. Uh, one development that we've seen since the Patriot Act, and really the Patriot Act introduced, uh, to my knowledge, this idea of that of sunsets, which were uh, 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 Congressman Sensenbrenner had, had discussed earlier. Uh, is, is your sense that there's the political will in Congress to continue having sunset provisions? We, they're updated every few years, and we keep sort of going through these cycles of uh, powers potentially elapsing and then Congress has to step in. Is, is that a positive way forward and do you think your colleagues agree me, or is that? Me, well, temporary? first of all, let me just say one thing. It, back in 2005, when 14 of the sunsets were made permanent, it wasn't uncontroversial. Quite a few of us opposed permanentizing some of them. Um, I don't remember which ones at this point, but it was not controversial, it was not uncontroversial. But the, the relatively few sunset provisions we still have certainly ought not to be made permanent because it is imperative that we have the kind of oversight uh, to, be, to have leverage. If it doesn't sunset, you have, Congress has much less leverage. If it has leverage, you have, for example, Section 215 will sunset, as, as Jim mentioned. Um, we had the Amash Amendment, uh, was it last year, which almost eliminated Section 215. The votes may very well be there to eliminate it, if um, uh, proper remedies through something like the USA Freedom Act is not enacted. And that gives those of us, uh, Jim, myself, and others in Congress who are sensitive to these questions, who want to make sure that the intelligence community is properly supervised and, and, and limited, some leverage. If these were made permanent, it's always much more difficult uh, to get uh, two houses and the president to agree on anything uh, than it is to to say you got to agree or otherwise it's going to change. Um, I'd modify what Jerry said in just one respect. I do think that the lone wolf terrorist provision ought to be made permanent. Uh, again, it wasn't up for consideration in 2005 because we'd had the law for only a few months uh, on that. But uh, given the type of threat that we face from ISIL and some of the other offshoots of Al Qaeda, some self-appointed, others not, uh, I think we have a, a great danger of a lone wolf terrorist uh, uh, being able to uh, uh, cause a great deal of damage and loss of life and, and injury. But in terms of Section 215 uh, and the roving wiretap uh, uh, provision, I think that they ought to remain sunsetted. Thank you both for the wonderful, thoughtful discussion. Please join me in thanking Thank you. Representative Senator Benner and Abbott. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.